Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Has anybody been set free from bondage, never to be the same again? Well, come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise in the house. Amen. Hallelujah. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me. You found me. You freed me. Held back the waters for my release. Oh, yeah, we. Come on, you're the God. Because you're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have torn. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. cloud by day a cloud by day it's a sign that you are with me a fire by night it's a guiding light to my feet you found me you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh yeah we come on you're the God because you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn, you have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, sing that again. You're the God, because you're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory, hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn, you have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on, that's worth getting excited about in the house of God. Amen. Come on. Hey. Woo. Jesus, I'm free. I'm free. Yeah. Hey, hey. Woo. Come on, you stepped in too. Hey. See you with me. And you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. And you marched me out in freedom into the promised land and now i will not forget you god i'll sing of all you've done death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love you stepped in you stepped into my egypt you took me by the hand and you marched me out in freedom into the promised land and now i forget you God I'll sing of all you've done death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love come on you're the God you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah come on sing hallelujah hallelujah you have torn you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah 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 come and lift your voice and sing it with me you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah come on sing hallelujah hallelujah you have torn you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah yeah hallelujah oh, yeah ho, ho, hey. Woo. hallelujah yeah thank you 
Jesus. We're so grateful, God. We're so thankful this morning for all you've done. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, sing it again. You stepped into. Oh, you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. And you marched me out in freedom. Into the promised land. And now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You stepped, you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand and you marched me out in freedom into the promised land. And now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. Yeah. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Well, come on. Are you grateful this morning, church? Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Let's just go before me in prayer. God, we thank you for this morning. It's the day that you created Jesus. And Lord God, we are thankful for your mercy and your grace. If not for that, God, we don't know where we would be. It probably wouldn't be here, God. So, God, we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to continue to do, Jesus. Lord, right now, I just thank you for all the fathers this morning. I thank you for blessing your hand upon every family. In Jesus' name, we thank you for an awesome day, for an awesome day in your presence, God. I thank you. Lord, there's nothing greater we can leave than a legacy of worship and praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So as men of God, Lord, help us. Give us the grace each and every day to worship you with our lives, with what we do, to honor you with what we say and how we speak. God, we worship you this morning, and we thank you for who you are. We give you all the glory, all the honor. Come on, everyone said, amen. God, we thank you. No matter what, you're making a way, Jesus. Where there seems to be no way, God, you're making a way. So grateful, God. Oh. So you are here. You are here. You're moving in our midst. We worship you worship you I worship you you are here you're working in this place I worship you I worship you come on sing that again you are here you are here you're moving you're moving in our midst I worship you I worship you worship you you are here you are here you're working in this place i worship you i worship you come on sing it waymaker waymaker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are. You're the way maker. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, you are here. You are here. You're touching every heart. I worship. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here healing. You're healing every heart. I worship. I worship you. With all my heart, God, I worship you. Oh, you are here. You are here turning lives. You're turning lives around. Oh, I worship. I worship you. I worship. I worship you. You are here, you 
seems so impossible you make a way you make a way but God the doctors say this they say that you make a way you're making a way oh, 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 oh. you make a way that's who you are God 
That is who you are. That's who you are, God. That's who you are, God. There's nothing impossible for you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're so worthy, Jesus. There's no one like you, God. We bless you, God. saints all the saints and angels they bow they bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the lamb of god and sing you're worthy of it all. Come on, he's worthy. And you're worthy of it all. For from you, for from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. We worship you, Jesus. God, who is like our God? Oh. Come on, sing that again with me. All the saints and angels, and all the saints and angels they bow they bow before your throne oh, all the elders cast their crowns before the lamb of god and so you are worthy you are worthy of it all yes you are you're worthy you're worthy of it all. Come on, for from you are all things. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. Lord, you deserve the glory. Oh, come on, church. Let's worship him this morning. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Yeah. Yes, you are, Jesus. Oh, you are worthy of it all. For from you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Yes, you are. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, let your worship rise this morning. 
We worship you, Jesus. Day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Lord, receive our worship. We worship you, King of Kings. Come on. Day and night. Day and night. Night and day. Let us so rise. Day and night. Night and day. You are worthy of it all. Yes, you are. Come on, lift your voice. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. For from you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, sing it, church. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Woo! Yes, you are. You are worthy of it all. For from you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, one more time. Lift your voice. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it. We exalt you, Jesus. You are worthy. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yes, you do, God. You deserve all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, God. Come on, sing it. For from you, for from you are all things. And to you are all things, for from you are all things. And to you, are, for from you, for from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Hallelujah. Let's keep it going a little bit more for our worship team. They have done an excellent job today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Celebration Church West Bank. Who, why? I'm so sorry. Celebration Church North Shore. I do apologize. It, it's the best bank. I, you got that right. So good morning, everyone. Today is Father's Day. You know, we are celebrating and honoring our fathers. You know, that isn't just the guys that you call dad, that could be brothers, uncles, that could be godfathers, that could be someone in your life that you look up to and you just get that fatherly advice uh, you see as a father figure. That could be single moms out there too that are out there taking care of these young ones on their own. So let's just take a second and give me a round of applause for all the dads and all the people out there that are influencing our future right now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online as we prepare to take up our offering. You know, we talk about how it's Father's Day and we honor our dads. We need to take the time right now. We're honoring our greatest dad, our most important father, the one who sacrificed everything for us. The one that is there for us day in and day out will never let us fall, will never let us suffer, will never be there without us. Our Father up in heaven will always be there for us, and we need to take the time to honor him right now as we take up this offering. 
know that your offering is coming to us and it is being done throughout the community and the state and the region, the works that our Father has called us to do. So thank you for that. Thank you for everything that you give to the ministry. And let us pray for the offering. Thank you, Lord, our Father. Thank you for the sacrifices. Thank you for the teachings. Thank you for the love and the grace that you bestow upon us every single day. Thank you for what you have done for us that we don't even realize. Thank you for what you've done for us that we have no idea how you've done it, but you've always been there and you've always done it. We take these offerings, we lift them up to you. We pray that they be multiplied to continue to do the works that you've called them to do. We thank you, we love you, we honor you, and we ask this through all glory and honor to your son, Jesus Christ. And as a congregation, we say... Father's Day. You're a great dad. Look how great I turned out. I hope you have the best Father's Day ever. Thanks for all you do for me. I mean, for real, Dad. Without me, today is just another day. You're the best dad ever. Your jokes are kind of funny. You look good, Dad. That's why I look so good. Gotcha. I look like my mama. I love you so much, Dad. I love you, Dad. I love you. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Happy Father's Day and welcome to Celebration Church. We're glad to have all of our men here on this special day. As you entered, you were handed a communication card. Please use it to request prayer or communicate with our pastors. Drop it off as you leave and we'll follow up with your request. At Celebration, we have ministries for the whole family. If you have children, our Kids Town ministry is happening right now. If you need assistance finding them, ask one of our ushers for help. Our Celebration Church offices will be closed tomorrow in observance of Juneteenth. This day commemorates the end of slavery in the United States and is celebrated as a reminder of the ongoing struggle for equality. Therefore, the Justice and Unity Team of Celebration Church is sponsoring Unify, a conference focused on biblical justice and unity on July 15th. Our aim for this conference is to ignite the heart, equip the mind, and propel the body of Christ forward in engaging in issues of justice and the holy work of loving our neighbors. The Unify Conference will feature powerful keynote messages from Pastor Jonathan Tremaine Thomas of the organization Silver Righteousness about gospel-centered justice, question and response sessions with local thought and community faith leaders, and dynamic breakout sessions enabling attendees to link arms and join hands with organizations making a difference in our communities. For more information or to register for the Unified Conference, see celebrationchurch.org. Sometimes when people visit Celebration Church, they ask us how often we celebrate communion. We usually celebrate communion on the last Sunday of the month. Next Sunday, we'll be participating in this special time of worship in all of our weekend services. Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason. Texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. It's almost time for the sermon. To find our sermon notes and pastor's article, go to webcc.info. Thanks for joining us at Celebration Church, where God is met, love is felt, and lives are changed. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day! Day.
and we welcome you to Celebration Church. We're so grateful that you're here in person with us. We welcome those of y'all that are joining us on our live stream, and we want to say happy Father's Day from Celebration Church. And I want to tell you, dads, if you have, or men in the room, if you have not gotten your snapped into a Slim Jim uh, beef jerky, this is a gift from us to you just to say we, we love you, we appreciate you, and happy Father's Day. And so before you leave today, someone will be at the door to be able to hand you one if you didn't get one on the way in. But we also want to take opportunity and recognize each and every one of you guys. You see, oftentimes we start talking about Father's Day, and you know we know that there's all kinds of fathers. You know, yes, there's the, there's the ones that, that have physical children, that there's the ones that have adopted kids, but then there's people that may have never been able to have kids. Or there's people that have kids that are grown and gone, and you may not be seeing them on this Father's Day. But you're still a dad. Maybe you're somebody that didn't have kids, but you've got neighbor's kids. You've got nieces and nephews. You've got kids at the church or young people or people in your life that look up to you, as it was said earlier. You're a father as well. You see, God has called all of us to be a spiritual parent, no matter what status we are. And so here's what I want to do today. If you have fit those categories I just talked about, I would ask you where you are to stand right now. We want to honor you. We want to recognize you. We want to thank God for you. So if you would, stand and allow us to honor you today. If you're a dad in the room, stand today. If you're a spiritual dad in the room, if you have someone you're mentoring or loving, stand today. We want to honor you. If you'll continue standing for just a minute. As you look around the room and you see some of these guys, I want you to know that the world is full of men just like this. And often we don't spend sitcoms and those kind of things spend their dear sweet time making fun of men, making fun of dads, but God has made you to do what you do, to be who you are, and to be a, a, an impact maker in this world. And so I want to thank you for what you do, and we want to praise God for you in prayer. So would you reach out your hand, stretch out your hand to someone near you, uh, and let's just pray for these men, and pray for the men they represent today. Father in heaven, we thank you, praise you, and love you for being an incredible, awesome father that gives us an example of what we are to model our lives after. And as we look around this room and we see men that, that represent all types and stages of fatherhood, we thank you for them, God. They are amazing. We are so grateful for those lives they're impacting, whether it be in their own home as a, as a dad or whether it be a, an uncle or, a, or a, na a great neighbor to their neighbor's kids or in the neighborhood, or, or they spent their lives pouring into children uh, uh, in the church and in various ways, God, or, or just at work, just spending time pouring into people younger than them and trying to mentor them to become a better version of themselves that God has made them to be. Thank you for the work they do. Thank you for who they are. Thank you for how you've wired them and made them and uniquely gifted them and made them like no one else. Every one of them in the room is like no one else in the room. God, they're all unique, and you made it that way. And so, God, we thank you for who they are, the gifts you've given them, the talents and abilities, the, the wisdom, Lord, the, the smarts you've given them, and just, God, just the, the ability just to love as you have loved. And so, God, bless them, anoint them, protect them, and use them, guide them in the days ahead, that they may be salt and light to the world around them, that they may be impact makers, they be influencers to the community in which they live. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for them, and we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, you may be seated, I want to encourage you to reach out to someone that you would call father, whether it be an earthly father or an uncle or, or someone that just has had an impact on your life. Reach out to them today and, and tell them happy Father's Day. Be grateful for the people that God has put in your life. I want to tell you today also, I hold here a $50 Home Depot, just so you know this, what it is, it's a Home Depot gift card. Those that are willing to fill out a communication card for me today, so that I may pray for you this week, you will have an opportunity of winning this $50 Home Depot gift card. And so I want to ask you today to take a moment, fill out that communication card, let me know how we at Celebration Church can minister to you, what steps that you need to take in your spiritual journey, uh, what's going on in your life that we can lift up and bathe in prayer this week. Uh, maybe you need to be baptized, or, or maybe you'd like to talk with me about a relationship with Jesus. I would love to follow up with you this week about that. But you've got to fill out that communication card and turn it in at the end of service. And you'll be reminded at the end of service about that in order to have an opportunity to win that card. Because we want you to win it. We want you to go get something to make, uh, make those people in your house happy that you're going to finally fix something or, or hang something up. Something they've been wanting to do, but you say, oh, I just don't have the money for that. Now you'll have $50 to go do something about it. And so take some time today and fill that out. You know, today we are talking, uh, uh, continuing our sermon series called Navigating the Challenges. We've been talking about all kinds of challenges. We've talked about navigating challenges of family and marriages and sex. 
Today we're talking about navigating the challenges of conflict. How many of you have been in conflict in the last seven days of some kind? You've been in an argument with your spouse, been arguing with your kids, you got an argument with somebody at work, maybe a neighbor over the boundaries of the property line there. You've got an argument with somebody, you've gotten your feelings hurt, they've gotten their feelings hurt. We've had conflict. And if you hadn't checked this out, you probably will in the next seven days. And even if you had it the last seven days, you're probably still going to have it in the next seven days. Why? Because conflict is part of a broken system, a broken world, sinful people. We like what we like, somebody else likes what they like, and as a result, we get into what? Conflict. Conflict is just a part of life. It results in personality differences, of ungodly attitudes. How many of y'all can, can testify about ungodly attitude in your life you've had? But many times, I just hadn't been very godly. Mm, I wanted to be, but I wasn't. Money problems. I mean, you can say amen. That can cause conflict. Sometimes internal conflict. You're just arguing with yourself about it. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, money is usually one of the top reasons divorces happen because of the financial stress and strain it puts on a relationship. There's so many things. Do you know that some of the major conflicts in the local church have been things like what color the carpet was going to be? And you say, yeah, I've heard that before. No, no, really. It, it really has. Churches have split. People have left. Because one person wanted the color red, one person wanted the color blue. I'm thinking both of them are nasty. Let's just don't do it anyway. Let's just do wood or, or, or concrete. But some people have, have argued over the color, the paint of the wall. I mean, it's amazing the things that people get into conflict over. In their homes, in the churches, in society, it's all over the place. I had a person one time that said they could no longer fellowship with our congregation uh, many years ago because we painted one wall in the youth room black. Now you're saying, why would you paint a wall black in church? Because we were using it as a backdrop for colorful crosses that our youth group were designing and painting, all of them unique, no two alike, and they would stand out on a black wall and they wouldn't have on other color walls. But they said, black interferes with my, with my, my mind. I'm like, well, sounds like you need some therapy. This is our youth room. This is a decision that our youth leaders and youth came to a consensus on before we made the decision, we're not going to change something for one person. And they left our church. Oh, it hurt my heart to see that, but I'm like, wow. We got bigger issues to fry, and we got walls we're talking about. But guys, that's the reality of the world we live in. People will get into conflict over some of the silliest, pettiest things in our homes and everywhere else. So I'll ask yourself this question today. What causes most of my conflict with others in my life? As we begin, I want us to look at the Word of God and see what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you take your Bibles or Bible app or you can look on the screen and follow along with me and let's stand together in the honor of reading God's Word. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 32. The Word of God says this. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generosity, generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement. Say that, encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We know today it will be challenging because we all deal with the issue of conflict. 100% of us in this room have been in a conflict in the last seven days or will be in the next seven days. It's part of a broken world. It's sin. But God, we don't want to be this way. We want to be difference makers. So I pray today that you would challenge our hearts and minds. Help us to uh, help things be revealed in our lives that we need to cast over to you. We need to lay at your feet so that you can, you can use us and build us up and help us be people of encouragement. Help us to be difference makers in the lives around us, God. Help us to be those that, that bring about resolution rather than bringing destruction. And God, I pray for if one today doesn't know you, they don't have a relationship with you, that today their hearts and minds will be open to that reality that you love them and gave yourself for them through Jesus, your only son. And God, that you desire a personal relationship with them. 
And so God, may today be a day of reconciliation as we talk about conflict. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Look, the Bible teaches that we can overcome conflict. How many of you want to be able to overcome conflict in your life? It teaches us how to overcome conflict and develop sweet and strong relationships with others. There's nothing more incredible than having great bonds of relationship. I know there's people that, that just warm my heart that I've had relationships over the years and have stayed in close contact with of all the different places God has brought us, whether it be overseas. I, I've got a friend named Grant that may be watching right now that lives in London. We met him at a mall when we were doing street ministry during the uh, 2016, 2016 London Games. We were there doing street ministry, and we met him. He was, he was going on his first day as an assignment as a what they call a games maker. Sounds like Hunger Games, right? Uh, and so he was a val uh, volunteer there, and he was nervous, nervous, nervous. So our group met him, talked with him, shared the gospel with him, laid hands and prayed over him, and he and I are on regular communication on Facebook Messenger ever since. He sent me gifts, I've sent him gifts, and it's just been the sweetest fellowship. And I want all of us to have those kind of relationships all throughout our life. You want those kind in your life? Well, we know the Bible can tell us how to obtain that. We can minimize conflict in our relationships by telling the truth. Say that word with me. Truth. Truth is an important thing. I know, I know how people will say something like, well, maybe what's true for you is not true for me. We live in this concept of society of relative truth, right? It, it might be true for you, no, not be true for me. People want to deny the fact that there's absolute truth, but there is absolute truth. We've said it before, and I'll say it again. Two plus two equals... Wow, y'all been in the same schools I've been to, right? But there's people out there stupid enough to try to say, no, 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 I can prove and justify that two plus two equals five. And they're trying to do it. Matter of fact, Common Core is about the most ridiculous nonsense I've ever seen and when it comes to Common Core math and the other education they do with Common Core. It's teaching kids to do stuff that don't even make sense. And you can't even get the answer right two out of, uh, or nine out of ten times when you do it the way they tell you to do it. Because the world's trying to say things that, 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 that just doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, we know that two plus two equals four. If that's true, then that means there is what? Absolute truth. So the nonsense that that's, there's not is stupid because we already acknowledge it in our mathematical system. Some of those same people will say, well, science has proven. Wait, you don't, prove, you don't believe there's absolute truth, but you're saying something has proven, which means that you've believed and bought into some truth that you're saying is absolute truth because this person, this person, this person has said it. Guys, there is absolute truth. It's not about your version of the truth. It's not about my version of the truth. It's the fact that there is truth. In Ephesians 4.25, Paul even says, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the what? Truth. For we are all parts of the same body. Folks, we're not telling a version of truth. We're telling what is true. And we need to be sharing truth everywhere we go. Don't you love how kids will leave out certain details when it comes to a situation you've caught them in? And they do that, why? Because they don't want to get in trouble. They'll leave out their part of the story so that they don't get in trouble. They'll make sure everybody, they tell all the other parts of the story and they'll say, I'm telling the truth. No, you're telling a version of the truth. No, there is all truth. I want to hear the whole thing. I want us to understand that adults aren't any different. We grow up, but we still do the same thing. We want people to look at us the best light possible. We don't want people to know the, the, all the ins and outs of our life, and so we'll leave certain things out. So we're not telling the whole truth about our life. I want you to hear this, that Satan's kingdom is characterized by dishonesty. God, or Jesus even says that he's the, he's the father of lies. While God's family is to be characterized by honesty. So if we want, to be, we want to be people that want to say we're going to stand on truth, that means we have to let truth be played out through our lives. Here's a good question to ask ourselves. Who's your daddy? I mean, if Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies, and we find dishonesty in our life, who then is our daddy? Satan. Or if we're willing to tell truth and let honesty win out, Who's our daddy? God the Father. Matter of fact, do it a second. Do something for me. Turn to your neighbor and ask him, who's your daddy? I want you to start thinking about that today. Because if we want to minimize these conflicts in our lives, then we have to be people of truth. We see this in Proverbs 12, 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the what? Truth. Truth isn't easy. Truth hurts. 
truth is hard. Truth is scary. We don't like to, we don't, none of us like to deal with the fallout of the consequences of something we've done. But when we do go about life not being honest and being dishonest about things and, and spreading untruths or partial truths, then we have to be willing to accept the consequences or the fallout that comes as a result of that. When we are dishonest, when we lie to escape consequences or to impress others or to mean others or manipulate others uh, or conserve energy or time, that's, that's why we do those things. But it doesn't help anything. It doesn't help our cause. It doesn't help relationships. It doesn't help anything. What's really bad is that once we tell one lie, what do we wind up doing? Tell another one. And then what? Another one. And then what? Another one. Next thing you know, you've dug a hole so deep, your head's barely sticking above, and you're wondering, how do I get out of this? Well, time to come clean so we can start filling the hole up and rising up out the hole. We have to come clean. We have to come honest. That's the reality in Celebrate Recovery. That's what I love about it so much. You have to be honest with who you are. You have to be honest and be willing to say, I'm screwed up. The Bible says very clearly that we're all broken people for all have Sin. i got to be honest with myself. I need to be truthful about myself. I need to be truthful about my circumstances. I need to be truthful in my conversations. I need to be truthful if I'm ever going to be able to be the person or the man that God has created me to be. A relationship, is built, a, a relationship built on anything less than the truth is destined for disaster. It's heading there. It's kind of like we talk about Hurricane Katrina. Everybody says, oh, how horrible uh, it was, how it flooded New Orleans. And Katrina didn't flood New Orleans. Let's get the facts straight. The truth was, for decades, we had a lack of ongoing repair and maintenance on the levees. The levees broke long after the storm blew out. The levees broke, and the city flooded because a failure of man to do what they were paid and hired or elected to do. That was man's fault. It could have been, it could have been uh, kept from happening, but it wasn't because we failed as man. We let people lie and deceive, and as a result, the city was destroyed. Not by a hurricane, but by failure or a, a, a bad, badly maintained levees. That's truth. And it's heading for disaster. Our lives, if we're not letting maintenance happen in our lives, that's what happens. I, I was watching a Disney movie the other night called Camp Rock. Anybody ever seen that? I don't know why I was watching it. I was bored, couldn't find nothing else on TV. So I, I threw on Camp Rock, and I was watching this Disney movie, and and uh, this young lady wanted everyone to think that she was somebody when she was, in reality, the camp cook's daughter. And the reason she was able to go to the camp was because her mother got a discounted rate and was getting paid to be there so she could afford to send her daughter to this camp. But she was telling all these people that her, her mom was some vice president of some Chinese MTV-type outfit. And she wanted everybody to believe it. You know what happened? At some point, the truth came out. And disaster. Relationships were almost completely destroyed. She almost couldn't even face anybody and finish out the camp because she didn't do what was right up front and she had to follow up. So let's not be that. Let's focus on be, being people of truth. Amen? We can minimize conflict in our relationships by conquering our anger. Say that with me. Conquering our anger. The Bible says this, don't, let, don't, let sin, uh, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devils. I've shared before that my oldest girls, when, when they were little, and I was a younger man, would describe me as the beast. Like from Beauty and the Beast. Of course, I look like the handsome prince, right? But man, I could roar. And my big bass voice already in conversation carries a room. And so you add that with anger and force behind it, it scared the fire out of anybody. And I would scare my kids because I got so angry. My anger gets so out of control. I'm grateful that I would never, I'd never abuse my kids in a physical sense. But I sure let my angry words do some things that are mine. I sure let my anger come out in the fact that I got into fights with the wall, and the wall would win. I'd hit corner post and broke my hand one time, broke this knuckle because I was so angry. I just punched the wall. I've left dents in walls because I was so angry. Anger could be a, a huge thing that would have defined my life when I was younger. I'm grateful that God delivered me of that. I'm grateful that God brought me past that and helped me to see that and, and gave me a tool like Steps to Freedom to, to figure out what was going on in my life to help rise up and take that out of my life because it could have been so destructive had it continued on into my life today. The Bible teaches that it is possible to be angry, though, and not sin. It's called righteous anger. 
And it's, and it's when we direct it at Satan and at sin in the world rather than at people. How many of us understand that when we see people screwing up in the world, that there's someone behind that and not that person? I mean, we want to say, oh, it's that person. They're broken, yes, and they're sinful, but there's a spiritual force always working, whether it be the spirit side of good and God or whether it be the spirit side of darkness and evil. There's always a side at work. and It goes back to who's our daddy. Who are we letting control our life? We have to look and recognize that there is powers that are happening that's, that's the, the, uh, that we can't see right now physically but are absolutely taking place. And we have to recognize that and, and, and realize that, that, that we've got to be angry at what the devil's trying to do. When we look in the world today, uh, we, we say, oh, this is the problem and this is the problem. No, it's not. Sin's the problem. And sin is ruled and reigned by Satan. He's the one controlling and manipulating and leading people to go in that direction. And people are following it because they're believing the lies. There's something happening that's creating the atmosphere that we are in today. It's not the person across the aisle from you. It's the devil that's trying to put the person across from the aisle in harm's way. There are plenty in the world to be angry about. Good, good anger drives us to do something in response to what we see and what gets us angry rather than trying to destroy someone, which is what bad anger does. Bad anger leads to harm and destruction always. There's never any good that ever comes out of it. Ask yourself this question. How has anger affected my relationships? I knew a man that would swear he was not an angry man. Matter of fact, when you see him, oftentimes, man, he'd be the first to come give you a hug and loving. But then it was the night that I had to confront him because he was in a drunken state and was putting his two-year-old boy in a dangerous situation because no one else was home. And when he was drunk, his family would often say, man, you just don't even know what he's like. And so they asked if I could go and, and meet uh, the grandmother at the home so that while he slept off his drunkenness, the boy could be at least in safety. Because the boy had a hard time falling asleep. And yet, you know, when people are drunk, they often do what? Fall asleep themselves. So it's putting this child in harm's way. Well, I got to find out the reality of this, anger, this man's anger when I confronted him and I showed up at his doorstep. Of course, he allowed me in. But once we got the boy to safety and it was just he and I, he reached out and grabbed me. With every bit of might, he was ready to slug me and knock me out. And the man had that kind of power. He was a very powerful man. And I was just like a deer in the headlights, not knowing what to do because I was put in a very awkward position with someone that I even cared very much about. What do I do here? I had to spend a, much time, a bunch of time talking him down from doing something and helping him realize what he was about to do, that he was about to knock out his pastor. And I can promise you that would harm our relationship forever. Is this really what you want to do? It took me about an hour of talking to him and convincing him with his hand clenched on my shoulder this way and this fist, this fist clenched, ready to hit me before he finally relented. We hugged it out. I put the, got him on the couch, put a cover on him, I said, sleep it off. And we talked about it a couple days later. But his anger, oh my gosh, his anger. His anger was about to destroy his relationship with his pastor that had poured into him and loved him through some other difficulties in life, including work and finances. Boy, that would have messed up a lot. But you know, that's what anger does. Anger can cost us financially, it can cost us physically, it can cost us relationally, it can cost us vocationally. Do you know people that walked out on jobs because they were angry? and later turn around and regret it that they did it because they realized they made a mistake. There's lots of people. That's what anger does to them. It makes them go cuckoo. And unresolved anger will cause us to be in bondage to the devil. How many of you want to be in bondage? Anybody want to say, oh, yeah, I love bondage, baby. Yes, bring it on. Bring the chain. Let's go to Home Depot. I got a $50 gift card. I'll buy you a new chain. That's what you really want. No, nobody likes bondage. But that's what anger does. It puts us in bondage. To overcome anger, we must confess it. Say that with me. Confess it. We have to control it. Say that with me. Control it. And we have to command the devil to leave us alone. Say, get behind me, devil. That's what we want to do. Man, we want the devil gone. We don't want him controlling our lives. And I want to remind you that salvation is a one-time event. But we have to recommit ourselves to the Lord every single day. Sometimes minute by minute of the day. So salvation is one time, but we have to surrender every day if we really want to see the devil get behind us. 
We have to recommit every day because the devil is sneaky. He's like that roaring lion the Bible describes him, seeking as those he can devour, which means he's, he's waiting in the edges. He's waiting in the weeds, waiting for the weak moments of our life so that like a lion does on a herd of animals looking for the sick or those pushed out to the outside, he will pounce in the weak moments. So we've got to be strong in the Lord so that we can sidestep the enemy's attack. To minimize conflict in our relationships, we do it by demonstrating integrity. Say that word with me. Integrity. Simple definition of integrity is who you are when no one's looking. Who you are when no one's looking. Paul says this, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and give generously to others in need. You know, there are all kinds of ways to, uh, to, to steal things. We often think about the thief that walks into the store and does a, little, uh, does a little stealing out and puts stuff in his pockets and pickpocket and do those kind of things. That's what we think about as stealing. We think about the person that breaks into a car and we think, oh, I'm not that kind of person. I hope none of you are that kind of person. But there's all kinds of stealing that we don't realize that happens. There's actions that we take and they damage relationship. Let's be honest. How many of us have borrowed something that we thought was okay to borrow but it may not have been okay to borrow, and we borrow it anyway, and the person we borrowed it from got extremely upset that we borrowed it. Anybody done that before? Could have been that neighbor. Could have been that family member. Could have been the daughters that go into mama's closet, right, and gets that shirt without asking, and only finds out later when mama goes in her closet and says, hey, what's this doing here, right? We see neighbors that go into somebody's, uh, uh, go to somebody's garage, and oh, they let me borrow the weed eater before, I'll be able to go in there and not even thinking that they may actually need that weed eater that day at that moment, and you just took the opportunity for them to do what they needed to do with it. See, we don't think about that all the time. It's those little things that we often do that can destroy relationships. It doesn't have to be going to stake in somebody's car. It doesn't have to be going to somebody robbing somebody's bank account. It's those little things that get under people's skin, and a little bit by little bit, it picks apart the relationship. You see... The Bible says in Proverbs 10 too, ill-gotten gains do not benefit, but righteousness rescues from death. You see, we damage relationships when we get what we did not earn. When we go and do what it wasn't ours to do, it was for somebody else. When we take credit for things that other people did. If you're the boss and you had employees that actually did the hard work and you never gave them the credit but took all the credit, you're a thief. Even if it's your team. If you're the employees that had the boss that did all the work and you try to take the credit, then you're the thief. There's all kinds of ways to steal and get what wasn't ours. And all of those things are harmful to relationships. We want to live off others. We want to get an easy meal ticket. We want to pull our own weight. Look, sometimes we steal from others when we don't work hard, which creates conflict with family members. How about that 30-year-old? We often joke about that story, right? The 30-year-old that's still living in mom and daddy's basement, sitting in his boxers playing the video games, and never paying an ounce for rent, but eat all the food, never provides for groceries, won't go get a job. I mean, we laugh about those kind of things, but the reality is, is that we all do things at times in our life that are taking from others without giving back. And you know what that's called? Theft. That's not the kind of people God's raised us to be. God wants more from us. And the Word of God even teaches us when it comes to family members, stuff in 1 Timothy 5. But those who won't care for other relatives, especially those in our own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Let me tell you what, guys. I want to tell you, it's not just about those in our own household. It can be, it can be if, we, if we're always getting from somebody and never giving to somebody. It can be a neighbor. It can be a, it can be a, a, a co-worker. It can be in the church, in the house of God. If we're always getting and never finding ways to give back, you know what? When we're just takers, essentially we're just thieves. We're stealing at heart. And God has not called us to be that. If we want to build relationships, we have to get beyond that. We have to do so much more. We can minimize conflict in our relationships by upgrading our communication. The Word of God says in Ephesians 4.29, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that the words will be an encouragement. Say that word with me. Encouragement to those who hear them. You have heard it said that it's not what we say, but how we say it. Oh, we can say truth. Oh, I love when people say, well, I'm just speaking the truth, Pastor. You ever been when people said something like that or had it said to you? 
I'm just speaking the truth. Yeah, and I just want to punch you in the face. No, man. The Bible's real clear. We're supposed to speak truth in love. And so there's a way to say, we have to work on improving our communication. There's nothing worse than firing off a text message only to come back later and find out somebody's feelings were hurt because of how you said or how direct it was. Man, you ever been offended by somebody's text message before? And they didn't mean it that way? Have you ever been affected by an email, but they didn't mean it that way? Have you ever been affected by a conversation? Maybe the pastor said something, and you said, oh, he's talking about me. I don't know, I don't know what's going on in your life. Unless you've given me permission, I'm not going to say nothing about you from here. But you got offended because of the way it was said? Look, we all get that way, right? We all get butt hurt at times because we, we're very sensitive people in nature. Man, society's gotten super sensitive about everything. But here's the deal. We have to be careful about how we communicate what we say. It's everything about our body language. It's everything about the words we use. It's everything about our, our facial expressions. Everything communicates what we're trying to say. And then when it comes to the things, like I said, about not using abusive language or foul language, I heard it said this way one time. It said, if all you can do is use curse words to communicate, then it demonstrates that you don't have an education to use anything better. It really speaks volumes to your intellect. Hate to say it, but it's true. If we can't have the intelligence to use intelligent words and something's wrong with our intellect, it needs to be fixed. We have to learn how to effectively communicate. When you go into the work, there's a, there's a, certain, there's a certain communication level you're supposed to have when you go into the workforce. Matter of fact, you can work in any industry that's service-oriented, and it's all about good customer service, which is about how you communicate to the people you're working for or serving. You can give somebody a hamburger, and you can give them a hamburger. They're glad to have it, but you can make somebody have a really good day just by saying a few kind words as you give them the hamburger. It makes all the difference in the world. Look, we have to choose words that affirm and edify and strengthen each other. We have to find ways of saying things that encourage each other. Whatever we got to do, search for them. Write a list down. If you got to make a, a, a list of all the encouraging words you can think of and carry that list around you, so that when you see somebody, you have to pull it out and find a word and say, let me say this to them today. Just do that for a minute. Just do that and see what happens. Send somebody an encouraging text message. Let them know you were thinking about them today and, and wonder how you want to pray for them. Man, it lifts people's spirits. Respond to somebody in an email in a very positive way. Even if what they're asking for seems in a very negative, respond in a very positive way. Watch what happens. It will often change them and may even convict them about what they were saying to you. It's amazing how you can take a negative situation. Man, it's amazing. I've come to, to, to be where I was a mediator in a conversation, and I was listening to two sides, whether it be a husband and wife or this, and I'd be listening to each other, and I would say something in a positive tone, and it would change the whole mood, change everything. It made them think about what they were doing, what they were saying. Or when somebody was directly coming at me very harshly, I'd say, hmm, well, that's a good point. Never thought about it that way. And changes things on a dime. Because you want to get people into a positive state of mind rather into a negative one. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, we will speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted. Let me ask you a question. If I were to ask your kids, what's your communication is like? What do you think they would say? If I were to ask your spouse, what your communication is like. What do you think they would say? That's the telltale. It's not about what you think about yourself. It's what others think about you. It's what they say about you. It's what they experience from you. That communicates everything about who you are. We can minimize conflict in our relationships by committing to godliness. Ephesians 4.30 says this, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Remember who you belong to. Matter of fact, turn to your neighbor and say that. Remember who you belong to. It's not even about who you are, but rather whose you are. It's about whose you are. When we keep our eyes and mind fixed on the one we declare 
that we belong to, it can change everything about our actions, our mindset, about our words, and anything else. It changes everything. I love that story of Peter walking on the water. And if we go back to the context of the story, we often focus on what was going on, but there was a raging storm that was taking place. And Jesus was walking. The people were scared to death. They're like, is this a ghost? And Peter's like, man, call to me. If you call to me, I'll come to you. I know who you are. Jesus says, come on here, Peter. He begins walking, and as long as Peter's eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was able to stay on top of that water in the midst of the storm that's swirling around him. Imagine walking in a hurricane, 125, 130, 140 mile an hour winds, and you're walking on the water without ever being pushed around by it. And as long as he focused on Jesus, he was able to do that. But the moment that Peter took his eyes off Jesus, what happened? Anybody know? He began to sink. He began to drown. Jesus reaches his hands out, and in that process, Peter's going to have to reach up, but also have to do what? Look up. Jesus looking down. And their eyes reconnect. And when that happens, Peter rises back up and continues the, continues the path. And then they walk back to the boat together. I love that. But guys, that's the reality of our lives. We have to remember whose we are and keep our eyes fixed on him. As long as we're able to do that, man, it, it affects our relationships that we have in this world. It affects how we communicate everything. It really is what lifts up our godly status. The Word of God says in Galatians 5, 16, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Oh, don't you hate it if you ever practice fasting and you're in the midst of fasting? And you pass by the grocery store frozen section and you see a brand new bluebell flavor that pops out. And man, your mind immediately goes to wanting that flavor. But you're in the middle of a fast. I can't have that. Oh, but I want it. And man, now, I, I'm sorry guys, if you're a lover of Dr. Pepper, I'm going to pray for you. I have no desire to try that new flavor. There's a lot of other good flavors of Bluebell that I love. I absolutely love. My favorite still is mint chocolate chip. Anybody with me on that one? Mint chocolate chip is great stuff right there. But man, if I'm in the middle of something godly with my mind, that all that, do is, all that ice cream is doing is, is distracting me and my, my sinful nature is wanting to go after that, even though it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is because of what I'm focused on right now. It's a massive distraction to me. Oh, it's so hard. When we're walking in the Spirit, we will be joyful, we'll be thankful, we'll be respectful to others. My wife can tell you on the days that I haven't been committed to the Lord. She can tell you. My attitude ain't real good. I'm sharp and snappy. Now, there's a difference. When I've committed my life, I can be in pain, I can be tired, but if my day has been committed to the Lord, I still respond differently. Versus I can be in perfect condition not be in pain, and not have committed my life and day to the Lord, I am miserably to be around. I will snap at the littlest things, the dumbest little things. I'll, I'll make them little quick, snappy remarks and stuff that, 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 that dig. It's unnecessary. My mind has to be focused on the Lord at all times if I'm going to be godly. You see, we always minimize conflict in our relationships by offering others forgiveness. Say that word with me. Forgiveness. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Isn't it amazing how wonderfully appreciative that we are of the forgiveness that God has given us? Aren't you grateful for the forgiveness you've been given? Doesn't matter what you've done. God has forgiven you. I mean, you could have gone out and robbed ten banks, killed three people, stole five cars, you could have burned ten houses, walk into the presence of God and say, God, I believe that you are God Almighty, that Jesus is your son. He died, buried, rose again. I invite you to my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to be the Savior and Lord of my life. Help me walk in your way. Help me live by your truth. And do you know what you receive? Forgiveness. And you receive eternal life. And you could have done all those things. But holy cow, somebody say something about you on Facebook. And dude, it's on like Donkey Kong. 
man, you ready to tear them up? You're going to hunt them down? You're going to slash their tires? I mean, you ready to go do all kinds of stuff. Just because they said something on a social media platform that five people read. But we like receiving forgiveness. But we sure don't like giving forgiveness. Look, we love to receive it. We don't like to give it. Yet, forgiveness is the mark of someone who is filled with kindness and tenderheartedness. The mark of someone who has been changed. The mark of someone who's living as the point before that's committed to godliness. It's the mark of somebody that belongs to Jesus. It's the mark that knows that people are broken and the devil's behind the brokenness and yet they're still going to love people no matter what they may say or what they may do. Yes, it hurts, but we have done way more than anybody has ever done to us than what we've done to God. That's the reality. And God still gave us forgiveness. His word said that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. I've said before, I'll say it again. In our worst, God did his best. Forgiveness was awful. And yet we struggle with some of the smallest things. This is what Colossians 3.12 says. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must, say that word with me, must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy and kindness. Wow. I like verses in the Bible that are verses with no excuse. My favorite verse in the Bible is Philippians 4.4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's my favorite verse of the Bible because Paul is telling me, I don't care what kind of day you got. I don't care what somebody said about you. I don't care what somebody's done to you. I don't care who said something about your mama. You're going to rejoice in the Lord because it ain't about you. It ain't about your circumstances. It's about Jesus always and forever. No excuse. I need those kind of verses in my life. And you know what I found? Everybody needs those kind of verses. You know Why? Because we're always busy making excuses why we can't. And God says, I'm removing the excuse. It's not about why you can't, it's why you won't. God says, I'm going to give you verses that all you can say is, I'm not going to do it, I won't do it. Not I can't. Because in God's kingdom there is no can't. The Bible says I can do all things. Not some things, not 99.9% .9 of things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever God's leading me to do, he's going to see me through. He's going to give me the ability to do whatever is necessary to accomplish his purpose, his will, always. Always. No excuse. So it doesn't matter about how I feel or what someone's done. Verses like these are commands, not options. Some of you may have grown up in a home that your parents made you hug your sibling to prove your forgiveness to one another. Anybody had a home like that? I was a single child, only child. Praise God for that. Now I could hug myself. I forgive myself. Yeah. Right. Well, hug myself. Love me some Chad. Well, I can't love you otherwise. The Bible says to love the neighbor as I love myself, so I love me a whole bunch. That way I can love you, right? But seriously, you see those kind of situations, and I've watched those kids that have had to do that. I've been in the presence of parents that made their kids do that. And them kids will do it. And they got the face like they just sucked a whole bag of lemons while they're doing it. It's like, this is the most miserable thing my parents could ever ask me to do. The only thing worse would make us kiss each other. Ugh. And it's not genuine. It's not what you want to do. And unfortunately, many adults have that same look on their face when it comes to forgiveness of someone that God has told us to forgive. They're like, uh-uh. I'm going to do it in theory, but not in reality. I might offer the words, but I'm going to have the lemon face look. It's not going to be pleasurable because our minds are not about glorifying God. Our minds are about what they've done. And God says, huh, let, me, let me just pull back the, the memory clock of all the things you've done. No. We do it because God has done it for us. Not only that, we're told this in Mark 11:25. When you're praying, first forgive anyone who you hold a grudge against. Mm, I don't like this so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Everybody say, ouch. So, okay, God, I'm praying today, and I'm asking you to forgive me of this, 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 this whole long list of things I've done since yesterday. And God says, son, Chad, man, I want to so bad. But you, you're holding on to unforgiveness about this person because they said something on Facebook about you. And you want me to forgive? I 
can't, son. I want to, but I'm not going to. The forgiveness is available, but only if you follow what I've said for your life. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. God's forgiveness is available, but it's not automatic when it comes to these kind of attitudes. God is trying to help us develop an attitude that is Christ-like. After all, what has God called us to do? He says he wants us to have the mind of Christ. He wants us to have the attitude. Even Jesus, when he was there at the Last Supper, he was washing their feet. And after the conversation with Peter and taking a bath and all that kind of stuff, he told the disciples, he said, what I'm doing, I want you to what? Go and do likewise. So in other words, God's desire for you and I was not just to be made in His image, but act out the image of Jesus in our life. So if we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive. And guys, that is hard stuff. I'm not saying that's easy for anybody in this room because I don't know what people have done to you. I don't know the kind of hurts that you're experiencing. I know the hurts that I have experienced. I know the things that people have done to me. And I know how difficult it has been for me to walk through some of those emotions in my life and offer forgiveness when I didn't want to. I was willing to hold on to the hurt because for whatever reason, however sick that may be, I felt more comfortable hanging on and having control on my emotions as though I felt like it was going to hurt somebody else. There is no hurt that we're ever given to anybody else when unforgiveness is the, is the characteristic of our life. The only person we're hurting is myself. I'm only hurting me. That person's probably already moved on, don't even care, don't even remember what they've done. they moved on with life. And so I have to be willing to give forgiveness. Forgiveness is required by God, and it's essential if we're going to have strong and satisfying relationships. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened. Oh, it, I love when people throw these verses of Bible, Bible verses down that don't exist. Forgive and forget, not in the Bible. You know? God helps those who help themselves, not in the Bible. Hey, I'm going to blow your mind. Spare the rod, spoil the child, not in the Bible. There's verses that allude to concepts like that, but that is not a verse in the Bible. There's lots of those kind of things that we believe. Forgive and forget is one that I hear so often. The Bible does not command nor teach that. It does command forgive, but you and I don't have the concept or ability to forget. It's what God allows us to keep for the purpose of building a boundary that we won't cross to. It's not a barrier, but a boundary that keeps us protected in the safety of what God has for our life. We remember so that we won't be stupid again, or we won't let somebody else be stupid again. But we do forgive. So I'm not asking you to forget. I'm not even going to tell you that, because God doesn't tell you that. But we do have to make ourselves vulnerable we do have to open ourselves up and let God work. We can't just shut ourselves up. Otherwise, we can take that $50 gift card and go get the chains because that's what's happening in our lives today. We have to be willing to release. We have to be willing to surrender. And surrender is a concept of giving up because everything I've tried has messed me up. We often talk about, in the concept we talked this last week in Celebrate Recovery, about turning. And the concept is, if I'm not surrendering, I've tried to do my way, my will, and that's what landed me in recovery, because my way don't work. Chad's way is broken, it's sinful, it's destructive, and all it does is create further hurt, habits, and hang-ups in my life that God doesn't want me to have. He wants to free me of those. So I have to be willing to surrender my way, I have to be willing to surrender my life, I have to be willing to surrender my will, so that God can do the work that's necessary you are broken. Say, I'm broken. I am broken. Say, you're broken. We are broken people because we live in a broken world. And it's broken because of sin. And you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. God's gift gave me the ability to have eternal life. Nothing I've done. What Jesus did fixed me for eternity. And then if I want a daily fix, I have to go to the Lord daily. And get what he has to provide. So here's what I want to ask you to do today. What is it? What is it that you need freedom from? What conflict that may be going on in your life that you need God to resolve? What conflict do you see in your family that you want to see God to resolve? What bondage may be in your life that you need freedom from? What person do you need to forgive? What is it that you need God to do today? I can't answer that for you, only you can. 
So I'm going to offer the opportunity. I'm going to offer the opportunity to pray over you today for whatever God is needing to bring you through. Whatever healing you need in your life, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come and join me here at the front. I just want to pray for God to do an amazing work in your life to free you from the conflicts, to free you from the bondage, to free you from the hurt, the unforgiveness, all of those things that's happening, to help you become a truth teller rather than someone that's deceptive. Someone that's actively giving rather than taking. Someone that's really following Christ and constantly seeking after godliness in their life. Someone like Peter that's looking at Jesus while you're walking in the water knowing you could sink and drown at any moment. But today, you just need the ability to, to always look at Jesus in the midst of the storm here. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you as we sing. And then we're just going to pray together right here. And watch God do an amazing work on this Father's Day. Whether you're a dad, or whether you're a mom, or whether you're nothing at all, or something, everything at all, whatever you are, whatever status you are. We want to see God work and move. Father, you're an amazing God. And you are worthy to be praised. There's no one like you. Never been, never will be. You are God, a Father that loves us unconditionally. Loved us so much you demonstrated that through the person of Jesus on the cross. You allowed him to die, you allowed him to be buried, and you rose him again so that we that choose to follow Jesus, the Savior and Lord, God, that we would, we would have eternal life and abundant life on earth. So God, you move in this time as only you can. And I give you the praise, honor, and glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Let's stand and let's just sing. And I want to invite you to come. Join me here at the front and we're going to have a time of prayer. Watch God do an amazing work in your life. For whatever it is you need God to do. So as we sing, you come right here. Join me here. Your good, good Father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Father, you are an amazing God. You're better than good. You're great. There is no one like you. And God, we come before you as broken people. We come before you as men and women that need your hand of grace. We're people that, that want to see conflicts resolved. God, I pray right now for those that, that's having a conflict in their marriage or a conflict their neighbor or with a, fa a family member, God, that they love dearly or our close personal friend. Lord, you're the one that can bring us through conflict. You're the one that can reveal the things in our life that may be causing the conflict. Father, I pray that we would understand that there's, there's always two sides to a coin. And even if we're mostly right, there's always still things that we have a tendency to say or do that's wrong. That, God, we're not always perfectly right. And so I pray for those conflicts right now that you'd help us first and foremost evaluate our lives. Help us to see in our lives what needs to be surrendered. God, maybe it's deciding that we need to live more godly and committing daily to you because maybe we haven't been as faithful as we should be each day. Father God, maybe it is. It is offering forgiveness to that person has hurt us so bad. Whatever they've done, God, that we would be able to just surrender that to you. And even in the quietness of this moment, say their name and say, I forgive. I forgive you. And that we'd find the chains falling off. Father, I pray today, if it's anger that's in someone's life, God, I know what you've done in my life and bringing that junk out of me. I pray today that that anger may be dropped. It may collapse in their life. That they would have a hard time making themselves angry because it's so far removed from them. That they would find deliverance and joy and peace in their life. Father, I pray for these relationships to be reformed. God, you said that you are a God of reconciliation, and your word also teaches you've given us the ministry 
of reconciliation. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to focus on reconciling those relationships that are hurt right now, that are strained, that are torn. And God, that you would help us to be better at what we do so that people can see God in us. They can see Jesus in us. They can see the Holy Ghost alive and well in us. That they would see us being light to the world, illuminating the darkness in this world so that people can see your truth and experience your freedom that you want to give. God, I love you. And I thank you for those lives right now that are just here to say, here I am. Work in me. Here I am. Fill me. Here I am. As Isaiah said, send me. Send us into the world to make a difference, to show a difference, demonstrate a difference that the world has never seen. And give you the praise, honor, and glory for your work in our lives, Lord. For your healing. For your freedom. For your joy. For your peace. All of those things that you give, God, we thank you and receive them today. And we give you glory, honor, and praise. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise today. Just a couple of quick closing announcements before we dismiss. Communication cards, once again, please make sure you fill that out and make sure you turn it in in the black bucket on your way out. We are having a drawing for that gift card for all the dads out there. And also just put information on there if you need prayer, if you need any type of guidance. And for this next thing that I'm about to announce, this is something to think about on the communication card. We are having in two weeks on Saturday, July 1st, Pastor Chad will be having an old-fashioned river baptism. So if you would like to join that, if you would like to make that commitment, that outward commitment to God, please contact Pastor Chad on that or put it on your communication card and let him know about that. And then that following Sunday is July 2nd. We are having our Family Fun Day Part 2. We had one earlier this year. We're going to have it again July 2nd after service, so please join us for that. It's a great time of fellowship, great time to just hang out with our church family, invite people to come to church, invite family and friends to attend the service, and then hang out. We will have food and drinks will be provided by the church, so please join us for that. And don't forget, next weekend we are having our communion at the, for the end of the month, so please make sure you join us for communion services. Other than that, everyone have a blessed and a happy day to all the dads out there. Much love once again. Let us stand and worship one more time.